I, I think about death all the time, I guess. There is this concept of living funerals. Is this the, the dying's responsibility? And I really want to be able to help you process death. But grief looks different for everybody also, right? Living funerals. Die, die, must try. <laughs> this is your daily catch up. Okay, so today's conversation is actually inspired by the late Michelle Ng, who held a living funeral for herself. Ooh. Yeah, you might have seen this in the news. Yeah. Not to be confused with someone knocking on the casket during the funeral. <laughs> So what happened is that uh, this lady, Michelle, who actually passed on in January, in December, she actually held a living funeral where she invited like friends and, well, I mean, she invited whoever she wanted to invite yeah. to go and then it, mm. I mean, it was as though a regular funeral was taking place, but she got to be there and hear like the what eulogies. people, yeah, what people said about her and then I like, see that gathering of people, right, mm. to commemorate her in a sense. Yeah, and that's then, nice. So it was quite interesting because, um, there is this concept of living funerals that like people in the US also do. Ah, it's yeah. a trend now, uh, or has it been like around for a while? I think recently with the topic of death becoming more of a less, sorry, becoming less of a taboo topic, then people are more comfortable with this and people are realizing that I don't want the funeral to just be like, I don't know what happens because I'm dead, yeah. right? Like I want to be there to like have a last, in a sense, meeting with everybody that I feel like mattered to me in my life. Yeah. yeah. Do you think people will still attend the actual funeral? <laughs> I mean, yeah. actually go already. Yeah. Maybe she would have. I don't, she I don't, already I don't know what she I had to say. La. Yeah, no, but because this may be in the West, but then in like Asia, right, there's still like customs that need to be done. Yeah, yeah, I still yeah. need to do the wig, then need mm. to do all the. So then no one is going to end but up. How does up. she know when she's going to pass? No, because she got she diagnosed with cancer, cancer in mm -hmm. a rare form of cancer in 2021, and then it kind of spread everywhere in her body by 2023. Right. So she, it was like, like no towards the end of her life already, and then she thought, like, okay, let me just hold this before I pass. Okay, I, okay, I think okay. it's so beautiful because much of the funeral industry is to make the living feel good. Mm. And you, like you, a lot of people, like even like those like, like bad kids are, they, when they cry at their parents' funeral and they regret this and they regret that mm. and all that stuff, right? It's like, mm, but your parents was alive like last week, but you didn't do much, you know? Mm. Oh. Yeah, like, I, I, you know, when you attend funerals and then you see those like, mm. those, right? <laughs> so I thought, this is really nice. Like, I would want. The, the, oh, really? It's whether, uh, not appealing to you at all, man. As in, I think super appealing. Yeah. Eh. I think to me doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter when I die, ah. But when I'm <laughs> when I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me clarify something. So Michelle was diagnosed with a rare form of ovarian cancer in 2021, and the cancer oh. spread to a lot of parts of her body by 2023, mm. and that was when she moved into a hospice. So it was actually, if I'm not wrong, a social worker that was, a medical social worker that was at the hospice that suggested to her, hey, do you want to like try hosting this for your loved ones? Mm. And another common term for this is also a celebration of life. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So then, uh, but she said she specifically wanted to call it a living funeral because she didn't want death to be something to be feared. And so she wanted to have something like a birthday party. Yeah. Right? So mm. an intimate atmosphere with good music, food and words of love. Yeah. So, how would y'all imagine, like if you were to host a living funeral for yourself, how would you do it? I, I used to think about my funeral in like my first iteration of, I, I think about death all the time, I guess. So like I I always think like the first iteration of that, that funeral is how many people will come and miss mm. me, mm. right? That was like my early iterations of when I die. Mm. And then after it evolved to, I think it was hip and cool at that time, lah, that like when I die, I want to be a party. Mm. No, have la, there was a trend. Must open champagne bottle. Must have like tequila shots la, then don't play the sad morning music, let's make it a party. The mm. girls must come with the champagne. Yeah, the, then I- Not so much. Then right. after that, I slowly realized that that is a very big burden on my family or the people <laughs> that's planning the funeral. Because <laughs> they can't just call a guy to do a standard funeral eh. They now need to like- But can you make party? party yeah, yes. make party, then like yeah. deal with drunk people. Then, then McDonald's hang up on you. <laughs> You know, like police can't even catch. I don't know like, or like they, they cannot sit down there and, and mourn properly if they want to mourn. They mm. need to step yeah. happy because mm. in my maybe my last video, I'm like, make it fun, you know? Then it's like super stressed. And then I come across a living funeral and things. Mm. It's very nice in a mm. sense whereby you can have that party and, and everything. Yeah. And then you get to hear your- uh, Yourself that? in third person. Uh. No, you, you get to hear your- your eulogy. eulogy. You get to hear your eulogy. Yeah. And then after that, now that the people that I'm closest to were there at my leaving funeral when I actually died, then what's mm. the fastest way to accept this post? Mm. Mm. And I, I think that's interesting because something that people always talk about is how they want to be remembered when they die. 
Mm. And in that like sense, you can legacy. pretty much find out. <laughs> yeah. I actually would do it, right? Almost straight up as close as possible to an actual funeral. I want to lie down in the middle. <laughs> 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 That's what I'm thinking. So did she lie down in the No, no, middle? no she didn't. It was just a party in her living room. Oh, I thought yeah. she was in the hospice if I'm not yeah, wrong. No, but you turn the bed around. So like instead of me like facing upwards <laughs> right that way, you turn the way around and then yeah. incline. So no, I it's face. like get crushed and then you got a phone in the coffee. <laughs> and someone is streaming it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on the flip side, right, I, I always also think about like, um, my, when I think about how close I am to a person, I always think, oh, would they show up for my funeral, right? Mm. And the worst part is that if no one will show up to your funeral, this time you're leaving funeral, you knew that, you know yes, who yeah. didn't turn up. No, then what are you going to do? Well, how does he know? It's yeah. so hard to show yeah. up to Cannot say Even no. if we're not close. <laughs> I will still be there. I will show up. <laughs> Can you imagine how you set out the invite for that? Save well, the date. Uh, <laughs> Save the date. Like oh. <laughs> no, they're awkward. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like they oh, will yeah. now know that, oh shit, you have this friend, you have this group yeah. of people and all that. Or like your friends might be there to offer support to your family, uh, your parents yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And and the, the funerals, now now for example, you attend a lot of funerals, it's very silo. Mm. Mm. You go there, you say hi to the family, then you go and pay your respects. Then you, you kind of stay with the people that you came with. Yeah. Yeah. But now it's like everyone's connected. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. It's just awkward if like everybody go there and then they, they have to say out how they feel in front of everybody else. Mm. I think yeah. what is interesting is that <laughs> my friend actually mentioned this at her 21st birthday party because that's like you pretty much invite all your groups of friends and then together, right? And then she said that like her happiest moment from that day was actually when we were as if everyone just sitting together having dinner, right? And then she see like all like different parts of her life like mesh together and then she's like, ah, like this is yeah. my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then she was super happy. <laughs> if you have to attend a living funeral, right? What kind of feelings do you have to carry out? carry with, you know, to the to the funeral. To the True. You say I tomorrow, to say then I say like, guys, actually I'm dying. Can what do you bring? Do you bring presents? What are end of life presents? Your presents. Because at the end of the day, right? No, no, no. <laughs> so, bring some diapers. So here's the thing, right? Like at the end of the day, when, when people are in funerals, like there's always so many things that have been left said, un unsaid, right? So many things left unsaid. And you botched that. Yeah, it's so easy, right? Yeah. Yeah, but but so Levan said, and like, I think there's a lot of regret, there's a lot of guilt and people that often want to speak or end up crying, right? The reason for that is because of all this like pent up stuff. And usually with funerals, you haven't seen this person for a while or so. Mm. So I feel like with these living funerals, I think the whole approach is to finally say what you have to say, law. like if there's any like secrets that you've kept from like a parent or an uncle or whatever, or like certain things that you've always wanted to show gratitude for, like this is the time... Maybe just it. the second part though. I feel no, like no, if, no. if you, let's say, uh, let's say, let's say Pat cheated on me with you, uh, for example, let's say, right? Cool. And then no. I die already, <sighs> I'm reaching end of life and you are mm. one of the few that I feel like, you know, I want you to be there at mm, my mm, mm, funeral. Mm, mm, mm. And you decide to come one week before and you say, by the way, Joe, I just want you to know I why do I do it? I will gotcha. murder you, sir. <laughs> you can't do anybody. Or you will cut some. I mean, I might die on that day. Eh. <laughs> you and then you can hold the real funeral. Like, you may one spot. Don't even pay double rental. No, like, I think, right? It's, okay, 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 I'm not saying reveal all secrets. I'm feeling that is. I'm saying that if it's the opportunity that if you do want to say something, like, now's the chance to say because sometimes you don't get that chance. Yeah, By the time yeah, you yeah. want to, the person already died. Yeah. So like, it could be, you know, oh, do you know when I was five years old, I actually broke your favorite vase. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, it's just one of those random Wait, things that you can laugh about. Wait, receiving all the bad news. Yeah. 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 Now that you tell me. Uh, <laughs> or like, you are adopted. Then you're like, <laughs> so, so who's my real parents? Then like, I don't know. But you're going to die tomorrow. Eh? <laughs> Maybe you I'll cannot. set some context. <laughs> <Okay>. So, so <laughs> Thank you. Um, when, when I moved to Singapore, my parents didn't move with me, but I was, my legal guardian was my maternal uncle. Right. And so mm. I, he essentially raised me from the ages of like 14 to like- Where is it? Your mother's brother? My mother's mm. brother. And so when he unfortunately got diagnosed with something that like they just couldn't like fix. La, mm. And he had about like, I think three months to live. Um, the good news was that having those three months felt like extra time for him because he had a health scare and he could have died then. And then, mm. then in the hospital, the three months he was there, everything was like extra time. So. Because we all took turns to like come and visit and take time uh, and take time out to like visit him, right? The one on one time I had with him was like time that I never ever had with him. Mm. Because even at home it was always like, hey, how's work? How's all these things? We almost felt like catch up friends. Um, but 
having that one one time, it suddenly felt normal to like broach certain topics that we don't normally talk about. It could have just been like about family and like what aspirations we have for like some of our younger cousins. That actually reminds me of like what the Mr. Ong Kok Song said that like he took leave from work because his wife was go- was going to die, right? And then the time that was spent with her, it was almost like mourning her or almost a celebration of their time together that like when she died, he wasn't as sad. Yeah. So I think like that's so interesting because it's almost like maybe a lot of what happens at funerals is that a lot of people suddenly realize, oh shit, they have so much regret like like we talked about, right? And then they're like, oh, all these things are unsaid. But then now bringing that chunk forward and letting it spread out over maybe a period of a few days, right? Yeah. Then you can resolve it with them and like there's something more cathartic about that. Yeah, it, it was very strange because I actually, like I, I take death very, very hard. Like, so because like, I think my grandparents all passed away before I was like 12 or like 14 or whatever. Right? And all those deaths really, really hit me. And then when my best friend passed away also when I was 18, I like I I mourned for like a year, but when he came to my uncle, I was actually very at peace when he passed, and it was because we had these like three months of just conversations and talking so much mm. about everything that I really felt there was nothing left that I needed to mm. to say or for him. I I hope lah mm. the the uh, the other way around as well. But by by that right, do you then come to the realization that when we mourn the loss of someone, mm. that the key things is the conversations that we never had. I mean, I don't think it's just the conversation. Yeah, is that a big? Is that a big thing? You think? I think it's didn't not realizing that this person would just be gone. Like, yeah. like that that sense of loss. Yeah. And so being able to process that preemptively. Yeah, I it's, think it was very intentional that we were processing his death together mm. because some another topic that we talked about was because all of like a lot of our family members that when we visited him, right, they would always talk about when he will get better. They will always say, but don't worry, like, okay, so now when you move back home, right, we will get a helper, we will mm-hmm. get a living nurse. They kept talking about plans of when he will get better. But when the doctor would talk to us, it didn't sound like he was going to get better. So when I had one one time with him, I, I, until now, maybe I, I still debate myself whether it was the right move or not, right? But when they were all away, I talked to him about, look, there's a chance that this is really it lah. And I really want to be able to help you process death together. And I think I was the only one that he really talked about where it came to him coming to terms with death because everyone else couldn't come to terms with it. Mm. And so he couldn't even process it himself. You know, there are homes that, that do palliative care, right? Which mm. is end yeah. of life care. Yeah. Yeah. And I always thought that if I fall sick, like the doctor deemed that I left, like the, at the moment I have a date lah, and the date mm. is like less than a year. I always feel like, of course I go there. Then I got 24 hour help and support. Then I don't shit on the bed that my, my family will have to clean and all that stuff, right? But then I realized, um, especially my parents and all that stuff, they still ask me questions like, when I owe you, will you send me to Ofo's home? And that's like terrible for them, mm-hmm. you know? But for me, it sounds- Like a blessing. Like normal, eh? It sounds like, mm-hmm. I, I would say it it's like a great duty. time. Ah, because but, they grew mm-hmm. up in a time, right? Where when you want to go to the airport, right? Somebody need to send you. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But now like life is so optimized in a way. Everything is so sending a friend or a family member to the airport is inconvenient because after yeah. I need to drive back. Eh. Yeah, it's very yeah. yeah. What if right, you know doctor like tell me for- I got three months to leave. Then after that I invite everyone come for the party already, right? Then I survive. Yeah, that's what Alistair and I were talking about. What if you hold a, a living funeral, right? But then actually <laughs> miracle happen, you never die. Then you monetize your following. Ooh, so maybe the Why? maybe the trick here, right, is not to go and wait until you're about to die and do a living funeral because you also don't know. Like maybe you just get hit by a car, you don't have that three yeah. months to live, ma. Like mm. the idea is instead of waiting for someone to go and host a birthday party for you every year, you take control and you host your own yearly party where everyone gets to celebrate. Where you. it's a semi funeral? Honestly, maybe, yeah. Honestly, that's what my grandmother is doing. Oh, like the eightieth, seventieth birthday is a big. Thing. Yeah. Like it's a dan- like dancing tables everywhere. Then everybody's invited and just have fun, mm. big right. cake and all this kind of nonsense. Got like like entertainment all that. Yeah. Then then as she got older, I think now we do like from 60, so 70, the 80, yeah. then 85. Oh, yeah. so like closer. Yeah. 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 Oh, intervals yeah, yeah, are shorter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 91, 92, 93, 94. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. But it's like, it's just celebrate, lor. just yeah. have fun. Lor. She's yeah. also like very like, I feel like something that I've learned about about death like recently right, is, or come to the realization of, right, is that the reason why you are sad or you're, you're so sad and, and you cannot get over death and all that right, is a lot to do with attachment, which is very different from, from I think, if, if you create attachment to something, I think it's very unhealthy because you keep thinking of the what ifs, the possibilities, rather than just 
appreciating the time that you have had with this person mm. or yeah. And, and, and to me that, that it's a very fine line. If you can separate the two, I think you will be able to accept the death more gracefully. Yeah, no, which is why I, where I wanted to go with this palliative care thing. Right. I feel like if honestly in your heart, you don't mind, right? Talk mm. to your family about this early, right? It's probably what I did. I mean, I've mm. already, right? Then I think it's a lot better because I think where where it's difficult on both sides, right? Is the family suddenly have to imagine life without you. Meaning I go home, I'm not going to see you anymore. Like at breakfast, we're not going to, we're going to mm. have dinner together. And you remove yourself from that routine first while you're still alive. Yeah. And yet at the same time, you don't make your last year of memory with your family members, you shitting the bed. Yeah, it's and a trial period of you away. Yeah, you know, you outsource that part. And when your family members that do want to see you, they come in, they will make the trip to see you or mm. they will video call you. Mm. And then you start coming to terms with the fact that you are ready to die. Mm. You know, as opposed to yeah. being exposed to new obstacles on the family, like you see suddenly your grandchild feel tuition, like you feel Chinese, then you worry about them or you know, your grandchild broke mm. out his girlfriend, then you worry about them. You don't take on any more of that. You you come, you wait for people to come and visit you. And then when it's when your time is up, right, you feel like you can let go also. You know, I feel like Yeah, it's, it's win win. But believe care expensive. No, but I feel <laughs> like, right, like at first when you go in, that is the vibe. Like, oh, I am not a burden. I am here, I live my mm. best life here, right? I don't trouble anybody. Uh, the people Shit that I bit. trouble, I pay yeah. to trouble. And then loneliness over hits. the period of time, like say you are there for one year, then mm. you see your family come like every week. Then space out to every month. Then space out to like once maybe a year. Yeah. Once every two months they come. Then I think that's when the loneliness just creeps in. You know? But I think it's by design. But the difference, right, is that our our relatives, right, the old now, right, they don't have very like solitary hobbies that you can do in a room. But when we get old, right, the gaming devices by then, right, will Same. be so small that we will be like, go our home. Our will be so thick. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll be like playing VR games. We'll be like, sure, no problem. Lah. I'll see you on Discord or whatever. You can, live, you can live guy. another 10 lifetimes before. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and I'm hopeful true. that it becomes a thing such that it's not you there, it's you and your best pals there. Yeah. There's something quite interesting, um, like a Reddit thread about this person saying, what if you cannot talk about death? Like you just simply cannot broach this topic with say your parents. So what this lady and her mom actually did, this is a different lady as the original lady that I mentioned just now. <laughs> so what this user and, and her mom did was they wrote sealed letters. So mm. inside these letters, it contains any wishes, like dying wishes, then details of your bank account, pension, life insurance, everything. And then like who to get what money, like essentially a small mini will. Right. And then like what will happen to your like prized possessions, that kind. I mean, my favorite soft toy or what I want to give to who. So then like these letters are given to each other, then will open when like the other person is dying. Yeah, my mom did that right before surgery. She did a knee surgery, but because she, she had complications, I mean, she had existing issues, Need right? Need to GA, is it? Yeah, so GA may not wake up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she actually wrote a letter for each one of us and then she tell us where it is, but like we can open. Yeah. Mm. Then you never open. So until now never open. Eh? I never open. Uh. No, oh. she didn't, no, when she comes back, she's like, you're going to open, you're going to open. Uh. Then she's like, make sure she disposes. Uh. I think she also probably say or whatnot. Uh. Yeah, but she I think you're not yeah. Yeah. I told her I open, I should open. Uh. You go inside, open it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you open, it's just a my relationship with funerals has always been like, uh, yeah, why do we care so much about funerals? Because funerals at the end of the day right, is for the living. I won't be there. Mm. I don't care what you do. Eh. I really mm. don't care what you do with my, my, my dead body or whatever. But Remains. Sure. Whatever you burn it or whatever throw away, I don't yeah. really care because I'm dead already. But then uh, I think... Uh, John uh, John Paul mentioned about um the how the living living funeral right it can be for your loved ones right to create a support system for themselves. Mm. Then again, I am thinking <laughs> about is this the the dying's responsibility to to help our loved ones right find peace. Yes, I, I don't think it's a responsibility. I think it's just like you love the person and you want them to be taken care of, law. It's a nice thing to do. La. It's an instinct. Yeah, yeah. so there's this Reddit thread, right? Okay. <laughs> this wow. guy, um, he talked about how his wife uh, and his uh, family, right? They all want him to hold a living funeral. Am but I the asshole for not wanting yeah. to participate in the living funeral for myself? Plot twist. Yeah, like he doesn't want- don't force la. He's up to the dead, man. He's the dying. But then he said it's, then then it's <laughs> the dying's responsibility to okay. make everybody feel- I don't think it's the dying's responsibility, but mm. I do think that post death, right? Like mm. for the individuals that have to deal with grief. Like I came across this quote and I'm sure a lot of people have heard it before, but like grief is love with nowhere to go. 
mm. with no place to go. You hear before? Yeah. Yeah. And and I and I found it quite Profile. interesting because I think the way it manifests itself is that when you are connected to all these other people who are also dealing with the same thing. And sometimes they may reach out to you or re you reach out to them. Then you start to realize that the love for that shared person is now being passed on or redirected to to, to these other people. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like that is a good place to channel that. Mm. Yeah. For, for this situation. Mm. I feel like maybe it's because I've never been to a funeral that I can't even picture how I want my own funeral. Like I just don't care. Just go and see lah. Bishan got a lot, yeah. <laughs> the older <laughs> neighbor. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. No, as in to me, it's yeah. like I die already lot, then whatever y'all want to do, y'all do. Oh. No, but I feel like there's an experience also like, like pet for uh pet's grandma, for example, right? Two years step further by planning her own funeral. Years before she died, she started paying the installment. Oh. Years before oh, she like died. Oh, like she choked the place that kind. No, no, you choked one. Not right. just that, but like for the actual funeral ceremony, oh. like yeah. it's all mm -hmm. before. Oh, so okay. she chose the menu. Oh. <laughs> she chose like the, there'll be a TV. And there's a specific service for this? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. okay. And in fact, the family tried to cancel it. They thought it was a scam because <laughs> they, she doesn't know how to do e-payments. So there was a guy in a suit, like a, like a Mormon. Kind of collect money. Will knock on the door and collect cash. Then the maid go and report to her children. Uh, and uh, say, she's I, I, this uncle always come and take money from the <laughs> mother and all that stuff, right? Then the mother don't care. And the mother kept paying and kept paying, kept paying. Then when one day the person died, then the uncle just decided to call this number and just... In his head, it's a scam already. Yeah. But he just call and see what happened. And we are ready to go. Uh, and then the person show up wow. with specific instructions. Mm. And then when he says, so how much? He say, your mother pay already. She 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 planned to pay across five years like, or three years, whatever, right? Mm. Um, but she passed on earlier. So actually the balance is like 2K. Mm. Yeah, that kind of thing. So mm. you 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 don't need to make the, especially for, for cash trap families, right? Mm. You think about, there's a lot of, and I've personally been through it where you look at aunties and uncles, right? That honestly, uh, you see them, they, they never visit at all. Nah. Mm. But when it comes down to it, right? They were like, why you all pick this coffin? This coffin so cheap. Pick, upgrade the coffin. This and that, you know, but they're not paying. But saying that helps them feel like better children. You know, there, there's a very warped mm. generation that is just like that. Lord. They just mm. use their mouth. It makes them feel better, you know? Yeah, I understand. And, and so there's a lot, a lot of debt going on. And the people that's paying for it or, or responsible for it, which is usually my family, which is why I've been to so many funerals, right? Mm. That they undertake the responsibility of that and let's not waste too much money. Let's not overcommit the money because the biting come in really, we will distribute to, we will cover costs and distribute to the children. And there's just really no point. We are buying this thing. We're going to burn it in three days. Like literally yeah. mm. burn it in three days. Eh? Mm. Yeah. And so like Pat's grandma, for example, settled her coffin already. And there's a TV there for a slideshow, which is something that you need to decide whether you want to pay this premium or not for the TV and a slideshow. Mm. You can also set your own picture. Because ah, no. a lot of times the and picture you don't get instructions. <laughs> there's instructions. Tell all my grandchildren to send uh, to send over pictures of me. So we, we got homework. Oh. So Pat, for example, we have to scroll, 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 and take, send selfies together. Ayoh. And so when we show up there, right? It's already the table show. like wedding, eh? Because got PowerPoint, is it? usually it's just a wooden table, yeah. then got the white plastic, right? Uh -uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one is red and like white cloth or red and gold cloth. Right. Then got flower. Oh. TV slide show, then you just realize that that was how the, her grandmother wanted to go. Mm. Yeah, mm. And it was so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Would you though? Would you would you pay for your funeral before it happens? I like, hope to. Set aside money. The mini, I think I will. You mm. Just so, though. just so you ease the burden for my love. Fifteen twenty k though. Yeah But okay, let's say let's look at the trade off though. Okay, let's go. Hypothetical. The, the I I feel like what helps and because once again I've seen so much death right. Mm. So much. What helps us quick process it or keep our shit together mm. is the fact that when the family member goes on, we have, we got shit to do. Yeah. I yep. don't know whether you pre-plan everything, right? Then their job is to just wait and feel the anxiety of someone has taken the body away. There's no decision to be made. There's nothing I can do. Because I feel oh, like the act like of having to do something uh, for them and then making decisions and like choose the makeup for that person and be like, yeah, I want a person to wear a blue suit. Yeah. I feel like that's cathartic in its own way. Mm. It mm. gives you a final remembrance, a final act of service. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know taking that away is selfish or not. Yeah, but you can always create other other like illusions of choices. But the executor of said will and all that stuff comes in later. Ma. Yeah, but it's also a very tiring job because I think there's quite a lot of people right, who get so invested in having to do all that that they grieve later on. Yeah. They don't feel it and then it hits them later. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, and is then that it becomes, a terrible thing though. I think so, eh? Because like 
I think you want to feel very much in the moment and present when the when like you know before they close the coffin, so you can see one last time and then have all the emotions poured out. And then once it's closed already, and then like in the incinerary already, and then you're like, oh shit, now it's hitting and like it's too late almost. But too late to what? I mean, you know what I mean. Like too late for you to process that while seeing the. I mean, the, what I'm saying is that there are just different yeah. moments in which you want to be very present for. And sometimes when your head's not in it because oh yeah, now I need to worry about the catering. Now yeah. I need to worry about this and that. Like I feel like you you distress your family from that so that yeah. they can really be in the moment. Then I think they heal earlier. Also. But most of the time for these processes also, there will be that one person that chooses that, that needs yeah. that. But then there will be the others that don't. Know. So like most of the time it's just thing. assigned or okay. allocated. Yeah, fair Because I feel like, it, like there were instances also, especially when I look at my parents where mm. they were running around and doing all the thing, right? Only when the funeral over or like re- like at the incinerator, mm. then they really sit down there and truly grieve because their work is done. Uh, you know, yeah. but in that grief, they also, I feel like they also feel like they did a final act of service for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And yeah, but grief looks different for everybody also, right? Like yeah. the duration, the process itself also. Yeah. I think one of the hardest things is when you go back, then you need the, to clean up. The person up, living yeah. with the person, yeah. right? Yeah. They're not there anymore. That one is shack. Yeah. For a lot of my family tree, right? During their palliative years, right? Or palliative months, right? They live with my family. Because mm-hmm. my mom was a tremendous caretaker. Huh. Yeah. So, we yes. always are the one to go back and clear their room. Yes. I, I think it's also very important for people to figure out what is an outlet of expression for them during grieving. Because I like, be it in written form or or maybe it's for some people it's music, for, for some people it's I don't know what lah. But I do think that there is a need for them to express their thoughts and feelings about the, the, the whoever has passed. Mm. Yeah, it really helps with the with the grieving process, I feel. Okay, I have a weird confession, yeah, which is a weird detail also. In that when whenever things happen, right, y'all keep talking about, you know, we need time to process. Like in, in the earlier episode, you talk about you need to like you need up to 24 hours to process an argument, for example, or like process the funeral to grieve with the body. Hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Eh. You've never had to. Because yeah. you process on the spot. It's that or it's gonna hit me. Everything, <laughs> at once. Everything everywhere. Yeah, you know, like to me, like for example, like the most personally traumatizing things that I needed to process was like getting over a breakup, for example, or uh, a death of my grandmother, which I was I was close to. Because for most of my relatives, I really never spent much time with them, right? But to me, is wow, really sad, yeah. Destroy myself, I don't be sad, like because sad is non productive to me. So like I would channel to productivity. Like when I get over my, trying to get over my first breakup, I would go to the gym. Then I would go and learn how to play guitar, you know? Cause like sit down there and set and you'll still be set tomorrow, my, if you don't do anything today, like you'll be less set, but mm. 1% less set. But if you learn guitar, mm-hmm. you might be marginally less set tomorrow, you know? I think mm. you are the last generation of stoic men. Stoic <laughs> men. You know, like mm. uh, like the generation that built this of nation. real men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, no, yeah. men don't. Okay, you are okay, okay. the last Capacity. manly man on this Singapore. No, but <laughs> I feel like it's the processing, right? Is trying to understand what and fully feel what the sadness is. Because sadness is too broad of a word to really articulate mm. like how you actually feel. And on top of that also, it's why you feel that way. So like for example, if your breakup example, it's what are you really sad about? Are you sad because you still want this person? Are you sad because you the relationship showed you why you are wrong for this person mm, or what you yeah. need to do, why you are not a good partner? Mm. Or is it just like certain regrets that you did or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like it could, or, or even like loss, like what we're talking about. No, so once I identify this, or does loneliness. it mean that I have processed it? I think that's part of it. Then what is the other? Like after I identify already and then? Being at peace at what happened. I, I, it always depends because at the that's, end of the day- That's me. An, like just like that. An emotional response is something that can be quite irrational. So yeah. then the confusion comes because you're like, why am I actually feeling this way? So then that expounds the sadness or disappointment or whatever. But being able to understand why am I feeling this way just allows you to then have the option. Okay, maybe it's because I realized that I'm wrong for this person. Mm-hmm. Or maybe like then if you know they're wrong for this person, then it helps you create actionable that maybe I need to identify yeah. what's a right person for me. Mm-hmm. Like there's actionables that come, but it really right. depends on what that understanding. It but doesn't but have do, to be right. Him, so my question is, do you actually like, for example, dedicate time, sit down there to process things? Yes. 
It, it looks different for different people. Yeah. Sometimes you could be distracting so yourself. I, I, I and believe then I do things that are considered processing. Yeah. 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 I just Definitely. Don't, la. I don't sit down there and process things. Like what right. you said just now yeah. about having the funeral planning done by your loved ones instead, right? Because mm. it helps them process. Lo. Yeah. It distracts them. But I think in that in, a, in some ways, it helps them to process. I feel like I belong to that kind of, that group of people. I need mm. to do things. Because, because when, let's for example, grief, right? I don't react immediately. I don't know how to, I haven't processed grief. So right. doing things at the end, maybe two months down, right? Then I start to think, oh, I miss this person. Yeah. Then that's where I, I will let myself feel the emotions and not be reactive at the start. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but but that, that's that's kind of similar in that I don't sit down there and try and process power through. Mm. It was just okay. Like let's say in in losing a loved one, like let's say my grandmother, right? So when she left, sad lah, cry, right? Mm-hmm. She took care of me and all that stuff, and now she's no longer here. Honestly. It's also because there were a lot of adults around me crying, so I can feel the sadness in the air. So it, it makes me want to cry also. Mm. So why am I sad? To me, there's no question of sad is so broad based. Uh, which sad? I, you know, like to me, that's not a question I ask. To me, I have lost a loved one. It's natural to be sad. I'm feeling sad. Sad, right? Mm-hmm. So then what what to do now? You know, I, I don't begin processing. I Until I just go and check on my family, see whether they're okay, we grab our shit. What, what do we need to go? We need to go back to the wake and clean up the wake. Let's go and clean up the wake. No, so I think that's what your processing looks like though. That like making sure that the family is taken care of. Like that's how you deal with the loss of this person. Ma. No, I, I think to answer her original question, which is that what is the point of this, right? You process to identify. Once you identify already, then this is the basically the, the first few steps, right? That leads you to finding closure towards this. Mm-hmm. Which but then, why do you need closure from? Because I think it frees you from being triggered later on. Mm. Yes. And it will keep re-triggering you because it's unresolved. It creates blockages. Mm. But let's say grief the death of a loved one. No, so that it could- Or let's say a, a, a breakup. As it, it could affect the way that you handle your relationships in the future. So it could be that, oh no, like maybe my best friend passed away, right? Then I think that like, because I've invested so much of my time and all that into this person. So that when they leave, right, I'm so sad, I can't do anything, I'm crippled. So yeah. in future, then I'm subconsciously like holding myself back from making such deep connections with people because I don't want to feel that same sense of loss. I, I'm curious yeah. to know whether it's a matter of him not experiencing certain things. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. That no, that's what I want to know. From feeling the right. nuance of it all. Because like prior to me experiencing depression, I said this before, right? When my friends talk about depression, I said, get over it. Lah. Mm. But then once I got depressed myself, then I was like, what? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> What's all this? <laughs> yeah, the, the depression, the yeah. tip iceberg, you know? It's like seeing a new color. Yeah, goddamn. Thank you very much for watching today's episode. I hope it has changed your view on talking about death, hopefully, maybe a bit. See you in the next one. Like, share, and subscribe. What He's talking about like, what if life happened backwards? So you kind of, you start off dead, right? After that, you wake up in an old people's home and you feel, so you start feeling better every day. You get kicked out for being too healthy. You go collect your pension and then you start work. You get a go watch and you get a retirement party on your first day. You work for 40 years <laughs> until you're young enough to enjoy your retirement. You party, drink alcohol and are generally promiscuous. Then you are ready for high school. Then you go to primary school, then you become a kid, then you play. You have no responsibilities and you become a baby until you are born. So your last nine months are floating around in a luxurious spa-like condition of central heating and room service on tap. And then voila, you finish off as an orgasm. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was great. It's so interesting. Like I really that. enjoyed it. Yeah. What a ride, yeah. <laughs>